Hey YouTube, Dozer here bringing you a new video. Today we're going to be going over my Road to Nationals performance at my one and only RTN of 2023, talking about the deck choice, the matchups, and how fun of an event it was. So let's get right into it. So right off the bat, I played Lexi in the CC RTN over at the Blue Post in Tennessee. It was about a 29-man RTN. Now we had a couple people that didn't show up. But uh, we had a nice big showing and a lot of rounds to play. We played five rounds of Swiss, and then we cut the top eight. So, spoiler alert, I made top four and got my Road to Nationals, Nationals invite. So I will be going to Nationals this year in Las Vegas to try and not only compete, but also pick up that sweet Prism Awakener of Soul cold foil that I'm so excited to be getting my hands on. Uh, how did we get there? Well, we played Lexi in all these different rounds. We played against two Dromides, two Oldhams. We played against uh, Alexi and a Visarai and a Dash. So we'll go over the matchups in a second, but let's talk about the deck list for a second. So this is pretty similar to what I've been having on the channel before. And um, it's a pretty fun deck list, a pretty good deck list. It served me well at the event. There was never really a time that I thought, oh man, I didn't have something. I felt like I had everything I needed when I played the games out. So. Right off the bat, we're playing Lexi's, uh, you know, Livewire. She's the Elemental Ranger, so of course we'll be having her there. Uh, this is pretty standard equipment for Lexi. You've got the Bullseye Bracers, which effectively gives you another arrow load on a turn, which can help you extend your turns, especially on three of the kind turns. Snapdragon Scalers, which is a way to get go again, to get things out of your arsenal, to set up some plays, as well as push a little bit of damage here and there, depending on, you know, normally your endless arrow plays, stuff like that. At the same time, we've got our Quiver of Wrestling Leaves, I didn't get to resolve this once the entire day. However, I played against a lot of matchups that I wasn't really able to uh, run this because I think that I'm more partial to using the Abyssal Quiver into certain matchups like Dromai and Oldham, so it didn't quite come up for me. Uh, but it's still a good card and it can be useful. Uh, obviously, we're reusing New Horizons. Uh, this card's fantastic for Lexi. It gives her access to some really amazing plays and it really is what makes the hero tick. Uh, speaking of ticking, Tunic. Don't forget your Tunic triggers. I didn't forget one during the course of the event. But uh, Tunic is really important for getting those low hand sizes to function. So the Tunic trigger can represent a whole card of value because if you send your Endless Arrow with the Voltaire trigger with the Go again, it can you know provide a lot of damage. And it can also turn on your Three of a Kinds and a whole bunch of other stuff. So Spring Tunic, while it's, um, it's a generic legendary card that's from the first set and it's a little expensive right now, it is really important at making the deck competitively viable. At the same time, we've got Voltaire Strike twice. This is Lexi's signature weapon. It's very powerful. And the reason that we obviously are running it is because it gives us that flexibility of the plus one or the go again on all of our arrows, and we can use it twice per turn. So we're not having to lean on this heavy pump style that Azalea has to do when you have you know one arrow per turn, so you have to pump them as big as possible. We can go wider with our attacks. Combined with the New Horizon to attack with an arrow from Arsenal we couldn't play last turn, three arrow turns are pretty common for Lexi. Sometimes you can even do four or five, depending on the, uh, the way things go. So the rest of the list is pretty standard. We've got nine Bolton Shot. Bolton Shot's a fantastic card with Voltaire because we can always give it that plus one to give it the go again and reload on hit, and it can extend our three behind turns. It's very powerful. At the same time, we've got three red Drill Shot. Drill Shot is very powerful at being able to give our opponent's armor a minus one armor counter, and that's really relevant against Oldham. Uh, unfortunately, it's not that relevant, actually, because not only did I hit one of the Oldhams I played against um, in the top four with the uh, with the drill shot really early on, I couldn't convert that into any meaningful damage over the course of the game because, well, Rampart's still really scary when you're trying to use these non-attack actions like Codex because they can pay into it efficiently enough and it's still a threat to, uh, which is insane, but drill shot is helpful, so it is a good card. Uh, Endless Arrow, this is the bread and butter for Lexi. This card really is how you win basically most of your matchups. It's a card that just keeps repeating itself, keeps giving you that value. And if you ever get past their blocks, you can just send it all the way in uh, and just, you know, bust everything, you know, snap dragons if you have to, um, with like a codex into a bullseye bracers with a floating resource. I mean, it can just pump so much damage, like a rain razor's turn, something like that. So endless arrow is fantastic. Uh, Falcon wing, go again out of arsenal, basically, um, you know, just always has go again, basically. So Falcon Wing's really, really powerful, um, just as a piece of glue. So normally you're gonna wanna throw this in your arsenal and save it for like an attack buff turn, like a Rain Razors or an Art of War or something, just to give you that little bit of extra uh, go wide value, because it's always gonna be worth three no matter what, uh, blocking, attacking, whatever. So it's pretty, pretty strong. 
Heatseeker is a good card. It's basically Snatch as an arrow, except it helps you double arsenal better or more easily. And it's a very good card, but oftentimes you'll find that you're not actually gonna get to resolve the effect because people block this out. And so the threat of it's very good though. And probably one of the more threatening arrows. Uh, infecting Shot, red and blue. Infecting Shot gives you a Blood Rot Pox token to your opponent whenever you hit them with it. And basically, uh, you know, two extra damage for a card like this is really good. Uh, as far as an arrow is concerned, it really helps you push damage. And um, while it's blockable, being able to get it up to a seven breakpoint off Rain Razors is really easy to do. And so oftentimes we'll be able to get that on hit through and just push a lot of damage. I'm on Pathing Helix Red because this card makes your three become turns much more scary. Uh, when you're not able to play things from hand, Pathing Helix can help you not only get more arrows in your arsenal, but also can help you get your Codex of Frailties, Inertias, things like that in your arsenal as well. can really help you catch up um, and punish your opponent for not blocking. So I think this card's really, really great. At the same time, we've got red and blue Searing Shots. The plus one damage is relevant. Um, it's just an efficient attack, so nothing more to really say there. Now, I'm not running Premeditate. I am running Take Aim. And the reason for that is twofold. One, I didn't want to spend another $100 on a play set of Premeditate. And on top of that, Take Aim is really strong. It allows you to reload cards before you do your three of a kind. So you can maybe reload something like a Codex, which allows you to, instead of having to pitch it, you can save in your arsenal, finish your turn with it like normal. And that's really strong while you're also getting the plus three. On top of that, it can also let you, again, load like a Bolton shot before your three of a kind or something. There are a lot of plays you can do uh, take game on three of a kind turns to help you go wider and taller at the same time. But the other thing about take game is that take game al allows you to play on smaller hands. And a really big reason that uh, Lexi likes Tunic is because she plays on small hands very well. And so if you're able to do take game into a endless arrow and you have snaps and bullseye bracers up and maybe even a Tunic resource, you're now representing at least you know, seven go again into four, go again into five if they don't block. So you're representing a lot of damage off of two cards in a tunic. So even if you didn't have the tunic, right, you could at least um, take aim, endless, snap it into a bullseye racer, which is at least, um, what, 12, 12 value, 12 damage off of two cards. That's pretty good. Yeah, you'd have to, you know, break your equipment or whatever, but the fact that take aim enables you to make plays like that, uh, when if you had to premeditate, it would kind of, You'd have to have a tunic resource exactly to be able to even make something sort of similar. So the, um, and then you'd have to ponder conflicting with the uh, endless arrow value as far as the end of turn value. So I think take game actually has a place in this list and I was very happy with it all day. I uh, never really thought, oh, I needed to premeditate here. It's like, no, take game enables you to get more value. And then the other thing too is right, is like, they're already trying to block us out. So why do we care about more on hits when we're not hitting anyway? Right, the matchups that we struggle into, like Oldham, whatever, we you know, we need the um, the play lines more than we need the ponder value, at least in my experience. Uh, maybe, you know, I'm a little wrong on that, but with Oldham Living Legend now, uh, I don't think we'll have to worry about that for too much longer anyway. So either way, uh, three of a kind, it's a great card. Draw three cards for one resource, pretty good. Downside's pretty easy to play around. Just have to run more arrows and fewer of these um, non-arrow cards. Art of War, three of. This card's awesome. I'm never running this deck without this again. Uh, being able to have the flexibility of the plus one for everything on the turn. Go again and get things out of Arsenal to open up your Bracers plays for a turn. Being able to use it as an attack reaction to get over blocks. Being able to filter your hand and get rid of blues to draw into more reds. and Or banish reds to draw more blues, as the case may be as well as even blocking from Arsenal if you can't cover a CNC or maybe you've got some Dominate you have to handle. This card does basically everything you could want it to. And uh, yeah, this card's fantastic. I am really glad I shelled out the money for them. Uh, Codex of Frailty, uh, yeah, this card's really strong. Um, it's not gonna necessarily be like a, like a God card, right? It's not like, a, oh, I just win the game because I played this, but there are situations that come up where it produces so much value that it will swing the game in your favor. And it is a really good way to catch up. So um, you can't just play it willy nilly. It's not just a free value, like, you know, Skeleton Sonata type effect where you just kind of play it and go, go, go. But it gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of options and using this card properly will make your deck very powerful. Rain Razors, fantastic card. It's raw value on all of her stuff. Does not need an introduction. Uh, Sleep Dart is really good. Um, I found that I was lasking 
Well, I wanted another yellow card, right? Because my ratios are 30 reds, 15 yellow, 15 blue in the main deck. And before that was Inertia Codex. But what I was finding was that there were a lot of times I didn't want to play the Inertia Codex and I needed to block more. And I didn't need the Inertia Codex into a lot of matchups. And so I was siding out a lot. And so I thought, okay, well, what's the best yellow card I can put there otherwise? And I centered on Sleep Tart, mainly because when you give it the plus one as a turn ender, it comes in for five, which is still a um, good break point. It's, you know, between five and six, they're basically the same. Uh, Sleep Dart against Dromai is really good because it turns off her Ash and Go Again stuff. So it's very relevant into her. It's very good into Lexi because she can't flip cards out of Arsenal. That can really jam her up, as well as being able to turn off Usuries, um, Tack React, all these types of things. Uh, Sleep Dart's really good at that. And so um, I could see myself going up to red Sleep Darts if the meta changed such that you would want that. Also, like maybe Katsu and even Phi, but. At the moment, yellow was fine and, you know, it was raw damage and it got me there in a lot of matchups and the yellow was really relevant. There were a lot of turns where I had, you know, this was my only yellow and, you know, having that one extra red probably would have done me in a couple times. So I was liking that. And then this is another interesting card. So blue lightning surge is something I've been on for a while now. I've been testing it out and I feel really good about it. Um, not only does it banish off Art of War to draw you cards if you draw a blue heavy hand, but Getting this off of a Heat Seeker or off of a Ponder token is really great because worst case scenario, it's 2 yellow again, which is great. Like compared to like, you know, other blue arrows like a blue um, Drill Shot or something. Blue Drill Shot obviously has some benefits over this card, but being able to flip this, attack with an Endless Arrow for 5 go again off of Voltaire, and then having that break point with Endless Arrow to get it up to 7 is really fantastic. And this enabling you to get things out of Arsenal um, is, is just really powerful. So. I never really felt the desire to have this be reds, and honestly, I didn't ever really needed this to block more than two, so it felt good all day. It's a fantastic card. Uh, Winter's Bite Blue, this is pretty standard. Uh, you just, you know, play this to rip a card out of your opponent's hand and make it harder for them to block. Very good against Dromai, very good against, um, you know, any deck that doesn't have a Tunic resource in that moment. The only thing it doesn't do much against is Oldham, because he just has always that one floating anyway, so it doesn't really do anything to him, but it can still be relevant. Um, as the game goes on. And then the sideboard, right? So in the sideboard, um, I had two Arctic Incarceration Red. This was mainly for the mirror as well as um, like ninjas or any other matchups where you can fall behind. Um, any deck that's trying to race you, you want to have this to kind of pump the brakes and to be able to say, hey, uh, I fell behind a little bit. I want to catch up. And so you use Red Arctic for that. Unfortunately, this doesn't do a whole lot versus like Fi in my experience. So I would say that um, it's not good enough on its own, but it does do its job, and it is a strong card, so it was worth two copies. Down and Dirty is here for Dromai. Being able to pop uh, dragons from Arsenal off of a Heat Seeker or Ponder is fantastic. Without IP penalty, uh, giving yourself an IP penalty, so um, an intellect penalty, I guess. So uh, Down and Dirty is really good for that. Um, Lightning Press is an interesting card. It's good in Dromai because it can give you poppers effectively. You block in the error, you activate this, and it makes your opponent's uh, dragon pop, so that's really good. At the same time, it's good into Oldham because you can help get those things like Endless Arrow or Drill Shot over the edge and really send home that value. And getting the plus one in the go again off, it's not trivial either. So I quite like Lightning Press as a two of. You don't want to have three of it because off of three, three of a kind or something, you're really likely to brick on that. And so having it be a two of felt like the right number to me. Uh, I outran three Codex of Inertia because against Oldham, you kind of need this card to be able to set up um, more damage through their arsenal stuff because if they have a tunic resource or if they have a you know crown active then you're really really struggling to actually hit them and so codex of inertia forcing the discard as well is really valuable to be able to close out games felt fantastic same time two remembrance and one quiver of abyssal depths um i ran only three remembrance effects because i thought this was plenty Unfortunately, I got fatigued by, I almost got fatigued by the first Oldham, and then the second Oldham did fatigue me in the end, um, because he had two Command and Conquerors lined up back to back when I was trying to pivot with my Rain Razor's Art of War through the kind turn that I had pitch stacked. And so, do I think I need three Remembrance for Oldham? Well, I maybe could have used it instead of the Heart of Ice, because this is basically just here for Kano and I, I guess Riptide, but you don't need this card at all. Um, and so, maybe a third Remembrance would have done me well, but. Either way, Oldham's Living Legendine, so we don't really care about that anymore. And I think that probably one Remembrance and one Quiver is probably plenty for like Dromai and Usury if you feel like you're getting fatigued in those matchups. 
outside of that. Um, I know there's other approaches to it, but those are the approaches that tend to work for me. Just having more cards in the deck, more Codex of Frailties, more Three of a Kinds, more good red arrows, and that tends to get me there in the end. So that was the um, the deck. My matchups were Dromai, Big Dragon Dromai, which was a loss for me. I had not played a paper in like a year, so I was making a lot of little mistakes and my opponent played it well, and so he was able to take the win uh, away from me. And then I went on to win the rest of my rounds of Swiss by winning against a Dash on Hanabi Blaster and Hyperdriver, very cool deck. Then I played against a Viserai who was on Royal Viserai, and he was definitely able to pressure me, but there was a turn where he drew like all reds and on my Arctic Incarceration that I had dropped on him, and I was able to push a lot of damage through on one of his low block turns with uh, Endless and uh, just a lot of damage that way. Then I played against a Oldham, Fatigue Oldham, which was again almost certain death for me. I was down to the very last couple of cards in my deck, but because I pitch stacked Codex of Inertia to be able to pull into either another Codex of Inertia or an Arrow, which were the only cards left in my deck, I was going to be able to uh, finish him off. And so I was barely in before time was called able to kill him and uh, and take him down. So that was a battle and a half. And then we went on to place a Dromai. So this was more of like the Empress uh, Mara Ferris Dromai type build, where you've got the you know the Snapdragons and a lot more of the aggressive cards rather than relying too much on the block. And so um, the matchup was really close. It was a really hard fought match, but uh, some timely uh, Phantasm poppers for me, as well as some good power turns off of things like you know Art of War on Bolton shots to hit multiple reloads and. Uh, really manipulating all the little intricacies of the uh, the attack actions for me. Working out in my favor, and I was able to get the win and secure my spot in top eight. In top eight, I faced against my buddy, Matt W, on Lexi. We were doing a mirror. Uh, I got to go, well, he made me go first as the higher seed, and I was able to load an endless arrow and was able to pass priority with go again, and he decided to take me up on the bluff and to load some arrows while I was... Um, you know, trying to set up, but then I send the endless arrow and now he blocks six. I rain razors, pump it up, codex of frailty, bring out my um, endless arrow again. He's got no more cards left in hand to block with. But he's got two arrows in arsenal. I send the endless at him for six, get it back to hand with snapdragons and with the go again. I use my floating resources, send it again at him for six, and then I have bracers to send it for another seven. So with that life lead, I was able to take the game and, you know, just stay on that front foot and barely close it out because I had some subpar hands But after that, but um, that's Lexi mirrors, right? Ranger mirrors tend to be pretty swingy, and so you kind of uh, yeah, look for those opportunities to take advantage of and, and see if you can win. So that locked me in for my Nationals invite, and then I faced uh, another Oldham in the top eight and top four. So he was playing a more like a mid rangey type of Oldham list that had a lot of disruption. You know, the Endless Winters, the Choke Slam, CNC, Spinal, uh, Mulches as well, and one Pummel, not notably. And uh, he played it immaculately. Uh, he made like no mistakes the entire game. He was keeping track of pitch very well. And though I brought in all of the cards that I could in the matchup, I basically just didn't bring in the Down and Dirties. Um, everything else, or in the Arctics, everything else I brought in. And um, I was able to get him down really low. I got his Rampart really early with the Drill Shot. But because I was unable to get the Cannon Conquerors out of his deck because of the crown cycling, I was just about to um, deck out. And um, basically, I, I just ran out of cards. I couldn't, couldn't attack him anymore, and so he got me. Um, however, he, it was really late at that point. We played like an hour and a half game, and he wanted to go home. So, you know, he, uh, he conceded right before the, uh, I was out of cards and uh, I went on to play in the finals, but, um, you know, obviously uh, that was a bit of a wash, but uh, in the finals I did play against Defy and the Defy matchup was pretty hard. Um, he was able to come out swinging and chip me down while I'm trying to set up my pivot turns, right, with Three of Kinds, Rain Razors, whatever. But the problem was, is that while I was getting ready to set up, I had a really awesome hand, you know, like Three of Kinds, Rain Razor, Art of War, whatever, he's coming in with Breaking Point for six, for five, right? I'm thinking, oh crap, now I have to block this um, to keep my my whole turn alive. And so that was brutal. I try and set up again, comes in with Command and Conquer for seven off of an Art of War. And I'm just like, I have to give him three cards. And I'm just like, oh my God, I, I've i already taken like 20 damage trying to set this up through all the chip damage. And now I'm having to continue to block and still not be able to crack back. So 
I almost brought it back though. We got him down to like seven or so before we died, but he was able to end up clutching out with just all the uh, Phoenix Flames and go wide. So uh, well played to everybody involved. Really enjoyed going to the um, Blue Post over in Tennessee and having a really great event. It's a lot of fun playing with people. Everyone there was a class act and we had a really great uh, time playing in the flesh and blood, making some new friends and uh, getting involved in the community. So if you are on the fence about going to your own events in person, please go. Everyone there that I've interacted with in flesh and blood has been fantastic. And the community is really just the reason we all play this game. So definitely give it a shot if you haven't already. If otherwise, I will be over in nationals in the United States this uh, end of summer in August. So hope to see you there. In the meantime, let's go play some events, have some fab fun, and let's wait for some Prism news. Until then, take care and have a good day. Peace.